Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the ATSU Research Nexus. We are excited to have Dr. Uh, John Westfall with us today. He is a family doctor researcher interested in community-based participatory research in rural and urban underserved communities. He has been involved in many PCORI grants and also serves as a merit reviewer. His work has included patients and community members for nearly two decades, and he cannot imagine doing healthcare work or research without active community engagement and leadership. He is committed to patient and community engagement to improve the health of individuals and communities. Dr. Westfall is going to share his knowledge and wisdom and expertise on the topic of card studies today. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Westfall. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. It's a pleasure to be here. I go by Jack. My official name is John, but my friends call me Jack. And so I hope by the end of the talk today, you all feel comfortable calling me Jack. Um, so I'm going to start this off. Um, as you can see on my name, I'm a medical doctor, an allopathic physician. However, I like to start with a little bit of osteopathic credibility. Um, so I have a whole bunch of relatives who were at Kirksville at A.T. Steele University. And if you look at the date on the lower left-hand corner, that's 1896, Uncle Elmer went to Kirksville with A.T. Steele University when he was 34 years old um, to become an osteopathic physician. And here is the whole raft of people who are from my family who went to A.T. Steele University. So Elmer, DeWitt Clinton, and Theo are all brothers. Um, they all went to osteopathic school in 1896 to 1901. DeWitt Clinton is my great-grandfather. Then the next three, Edgar, William, Royal, and, and so those three are cousins. And Uncle Kenneth was a very prominent member of my extended family who everybody talked about, old Uncle Kenneth. Um, however, his brother, who was my grandfather, E.R., Eugene Raymond, um, also went to Kirksville in 1921, but he flunked um, out uh, of Kirksville supposedly because he had poor vision. Um, I think it's because he got my grandmother pregnant and had my father and had to take care of that. Um, then my doctor growing up, Bob Jensen, went to in 1981. He was my brother's best friend, and he's really who guided me into healthcare. My best friend in college went to Kirksville um, when I went to uh, the University of Kansas. My niece, uh, graduated from Kirksville in 2006 and is now a faculty at the Mayo Family Medicine Residency. <clears throat> so a little bit of osteopathic uh, um, credibility or at least a little bit of history here. Um, Elmer and Edgar were on the tennis team. Um, here's some uh, folks who they're, they're in there somewhere and Andrew Still's in there with them. Um, I like this one, Edgar and... William Royal, um, I, William Royal, I'm not sure. Uncle Uncle William, we call it, he was Royal was is the way he went by. But his motto is a little bit concerning. Uh, what the heck? I do. I appreciate Edgar's wait and see. Um, time is our best diagnostician, and I tell my siblings that all the time. I'm just not about sure about the collect before treatment. And there's the class of 1921. And this is a little uh, telegram from my great-grandfather to Charles Still. Profoundest sympathy for you and your brother and sister in the loss of your illustrious father. To have been the child of so good and great a man is a heritage left but to a few. Grateful millions reverently thank God that ever touched their lives um, regarding A.T. Still. Universe, or A. T. Still. Um, so uh, I am a big fan of osteopathic uh, medicine and A.T. Still University in particular. Um, but let's talk about what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a little bit about the rationale for conducting research in a variety of settings. We'll describe the purpose, process, and key aspects of card studies. Um, we'll think about what are the appropriate questions, because not every study 
is appropriate for card study methodology. And then maybe we'll outline a card study or you'll think about it or we'll, we'll go through a couple of possibilities of how a card study might be conducted within osteopathic practices. Disclosures, I have no financial relationships to discuss. I will not discuss any off-label or investigational use in my presentations. Here's some references. Um, a few more disclosures. <clears throat> I'm not an osteopath or an osteopathic physician. I'm an allopathic family doctor researcher. I practiced 30 years with MDs and DOs in the practice. Um, I've learned a few low velocity and trigger point maneuvers. Um, I am an eager learner, curious, and ready to listen to folks who um, share my commitment to making the lives of our patients better. So research and clinical practice. So there's a lot of types of research that can be done in clinical practice. It's not all just in a laboratory or at a tertiary medical center. Observational research, survey research. We're going to talk specifically about a research, a survey methodology called card studies. But you can do clinical research, randomized trials, certainly comparative effectiveness, patient-centered outcomes, epidemiology, and population health. And you can do research amongst primary care clinicians or amongst osteopaths in all of the settings in which they practice. Primary care, specialty, hospital, ER. We're doing some uh, work with DO TouchNet uh, amongst uh, osteopaths that spend most of their time doing osteopathic manipulation in hospitals. Um, it's wherever patients need us, um, including the community. That's where good research can be done. So what's a card study? Okay, so there, this is a, there will be a test at the end. Answer, answer is it's a survey, but it's a particular survey and collective collection method. So it's not just a survey. It's an observational study that collects patient level survey data at the point of care. So when you're seeing a patient in the clinic, you fill out the survey. Card studies have been used to describe clinical problems for over 40 years. This isn't a new method, it's been used a lot in lots of practice-based research networks and communities throughout the country. And I'll show you some examples. <clears throat> it also um, sometimes gets at a place where electronic health records can't get. So around clinical knowledge and behavior, perceptions of conditions. And it's still a robust method for describing clinical care um, and making a comeback. The name derives actually from a weekly return card introduced by the Sentinel stations in the Netherlands and later modified by the Ambulatory Sentinel Practice Network. They were called Codman cards, named after Ernest Codman for a long time because he would collect a short card on patients with particular illnesses so that then he could analyze those at the end of each month. The pocket-sized card, which was designed to take fewer than 60 seconds to complete, allowed clinicians to carry it from room to room when they saw eligible patients with a particular condition. Um, it's designed to be completed as patients are seen by the clinician as they provide the care. Here's a short history of practice-based research networks that really talks a lot about card studies. It's by Larry Green and John Hickner, and I hope you'll look this one up. It's a short history of primary care practice-based research networks to learn a little bit more about um, card studies from that article. And let me, I really can't get a lecture done without uh, talking about Car White and the ecology of medical care, because this is partly why we do research in practices and why card studies are such a good method. Car White in 1960s was an iconoclastic physician who looked at all the data available in the United States and found that each month, among 1,000 people living in a community, about 700 of them would express an illness or injury during that month. About 200 of them would go to their primary care clinician. 10 of them would be hospitalized and one would be hospitalized in an academic medical center, just one. And yet 
that's where most academic research is done in that little teeny tiny itsy bitsy box in the lower right hand corner. And then we always wonder why it, why don't those results translate out into the community? Well, the people who go to the university academic medical center are very different than the people who go to a community hospital or an ambulatory primary care setting. Here's where most of the good stuff happens out in primary care in the community amongst people with or without an illness, uh, preventive care, primary care, um, ambulatory care, whether it's primary care or specialty care, um, lots of stuff happens outside that academic tertiary medical center. Here are a couple of card studies that made a difference in how healthcare was delivered. People say, well, you know, Jack, it's just a card study. It's just a survey and a couple of primary care practices. How could it make that big a difference? Well, in the 1980s, when I went to medical school, we were trained that any woman who was having a miscarriage would get an immediate DNC, a dilatation and curatage. She would have a uterine evacuation with a sharp curatage immediately. We thought that was the standard of care. Well, it was the standard of care. We thought it was safest, decreased the risk of bleeding, decreased the risk of infection. That is, except for some family doctors who said, well, that's not what I do. Sometimes if I know the patient and I know where they live and I know they have a phone, I take a wait and watch approach. And so I don't necessarily do a DNC immediately. I don't do a surgical procedure until I need it. So ambu the Ambulatory Sentinel Practice Network did a card study. And they asked their 50 doctors around the country to keep track of all their miscarriages and fill out a card, one of these little cards about who the patient was, what was going on. They collected those. And lo and behold, about half the time, a wait and watch approach was taken by family doctors for a miscarriage and there were no bad outcomes. No one needed a blood transfusion. No one needed IV antibiotics. No one was hospitalized and no one died. And it became clear in 1988, published in the Journal of the American Board of Family Practice, based on a card study in Aspen, that a wait and watch approach was a safe way to manage a miscarriage. Well, within two years, 1990, when I was finishing up my training, the culture had changed. And now the standard of care was a wait and watch approach. In two years, obstetricians, family doctors, uh, uh, ER physicians went from an immediate DNC to a wait and watch approach and only intervene if you need to. That's the power of a card study of observational research in a practice. Um, the second one down below it, headaches. Um, at the time in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, CT scans had just become the popular thing. Every hospital had bought a CT scan and everyone with a headache was getting a CT scan. In fact, that was the standard of care. That's what the American Headache Society said. A new headache, get a CT scan. Some family doctors in Aspen said, yeah, it's not what I do. Sometimes if they don't have other risk factors, if I know who they are and I know how I can contact them and they can contact me, I take a wait and watch approach and do a CT scan if we need to in the next 24 to 48 hours. So they did a card study use of CT scans for the investigation of headache, a report from Aspen, part one and part two. And what they found was that a wait and watch approach for a patient with a new headache was safe and effective, and you didn't miss anything. You didn't miss bleeds or tumors. And that uh, in the right patient, a wait and watch approach was very safe. This also changed the practice of medicine from new headache, CT scan to new headache. Well, let's think about this. Maybe we do a CT scan if there are other findings or if we're not sure about the, uh, the relationship I have with the patient and whether I can contact them at the appropriate time. Um, and then the third one here is that PBRN weekly return cards are accurate. 
So they did actual comparison of the cards and then went back to the practices and reviewed the charts to make sure that those cards were actually accurate. And lo and behold, the surveys, the card studies were accurate when compared to the electronic health record. Here's what one looks like back then. Um, this was for Ambulatory Sentinel Practice Network. Um, you'd put the date, the patient's name. This was specific to people who were having a spontaneous miscarriage. Um, they've come a long way, baby. Um, we uh, now use other forms of collecting these data. Um, here's a couple of other studies that we did. We were interested in missing clinical information during primary care visits. You've all been there. You are in a practice, patient comes in, they say, well, I was hospitalized and I had some blood tests and the blood tests were abnormal. And the doctor on discharge told me, go see your primary care doc and follow up on those blood tests. And you're like, well, I don't have those blood tests. And so you, you know, they exist, but you don't know what they are. And so what happens? So we did a card study. 32 primary care clinics, 200 and some clinicians, and each clinician completed about 10 to 15 surveys or cards, but we got 1,600 patient visits between May and December of 2003. Each visit, every clinician just spent a half a day completing surveys for the patients they saw in that half day. But when you spread that out, it's not that little box in the right-hand corner of the car white box. It's out into the bigger ambulatory care box. So it's very generalizable to practice. It's sort of a whole bunch of different types of clinics, urban and rural and community health centers and private practice. So you really start eliminating the bias associated with doing research in the academic medical center and get it out into the clinic. And for a very low burden, each clinician only spent a half day and filled out eight to 12 surveys that take each about a minute. So each clinician really only the bur was the burden was about eight to 10 minutes um, during that research project. Um, this is a paper we did describing card studies for observational research in practice. And it goes through a number of the methods and I'd if you're interested in card studies, please get this paper. It's a very good paper about the methods. This is a methodology paper. And I'll go over a couple more of the projects that we um, reported on in this paper. <clears throat> so as a method, as I said, take home message, card study is a survey. They're completed by participating practices during a short period, either a full day or a half day, usually 10 or um, sometimes if you... Uh, if you're doing a particular topic that's un that's rare, you may say, well, we're not gonna do it for every patient you see for a half day. We're gonna do it just for the patients you see with X condition, a miscarriage, a headache, COPD, asthma, and you fill it out just for patients with a specific condition. So there's two, two ways to do those card studies. Um, typically the clinician completes the card at the time of the visit, however, there are variations. Some clinicians um, stack those, you know, up to the end of the day. And when they're doing their charting, they fill out the survey card when they're doing their charting. So it really uh, varies from clinician to clinician and practice to practice. And that's one of the cool things about card studies is they're very flexible and amenable to sort of a pragmatic approach in, in practices. Well, what kinds of questions? can you ask in a card study? A far and away, one of my favorites are what I call prevalence studies. How often does this happen in a practice? How often do I see somebody? We did one with, you know, missing information and, you know, 35% of the time there was missing information. The cool thing about that card study was the first question was, do you believe that there's information or data related to this patient that you don't have access to right now? If they say no, then they're done. They only answer one question for that survey. If they say yes, then there were some other questions. So we were able to identify the prevalence of that. So if you're doing something unusual, we're doing a study on long COVID. <clears throat> so the first question is, does this patient report that they have long COVID? Yes, no. 
If it's yes, you answer some more questions. If it's no, you're done with that survey. So we're able to identify the prevalence of conditions in primary care practices. You know, you have to make sure that the potential sites have the appropriate patient population. I'm starting a job at the Denver jail. It's a men's jail. Probably not going to do something on miscarriage in the men's jail. So you need to make sure that the question matches the study population. Nice thing about most primary care practices, they're pretty broad. Can clinicians answer the questions at the time of encounter or immediately thereafter? That is, they don't have to look up a bunch of information. They don't have to go um, search the internet. They don't have to go to the hospital chart. They don't have to, They it's information that's easily accessible at the time of the visit. Because this is really around observation of what happens in the visit. Are the inclusion and cri exclusion criteria simple enough to make determinations? If you only want men, only want women, only want kids or adults, how hard are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? And can this be done in a minute or less? Part of our commitment to our practices is, on average, this is a questionnaire study, card study that's going to take about a minute to complete on average. If half the questions are one answer and you're done, you know, if it takes a minute and a half to fill out the rest, you've averaged about a minute for the cards. Here's a whole bunch more and the number of cards that we were actually able to collect. So what factors influence changes in type 2 diabetes treatment? This one grew out of the a clinical uh, clinician in one of our practices who was very curious about this, and he led this study. We used 19 practices, 88 clinicians. We gathered 488 survey responses, and everybody, no one um, <clears throat> contributed more than about 10 to 15. A couple on diabetes and blood pressure, um, safe medication practices. What are the primary reasons a pharmacy calls to clarify a prescription? Um, this was actually a pharmacy study. So the pharmacies were calling the practice. And any time a pharmacist called a practice, the practice completed this, this survey, 22 practices, 567 cards. We found out what's going on. What's the, what's the mismatch between information at the pharmacy and the primary care practice? Medical errors. We did a medical errors study. Um, did a big project on acanthosis nigricans. Um, just two practices, 20 clinicians, but 311 cards were collected. And now we get to some of the big ones. The impact of patient medication requests on clinical encounter. This was um, related to direct advertising. We were concerned that direct advertising was impacting the way clinicians were practicing. 22 practices, 168 clinicians gathered 1,600 surveys um, uh, with an average of about 10 surveys per person. In factors influencing referrals for mental health, factors associated with colorectal cancer screening, description of ambulatory care patients. And you can see there's a whole lot of cool projects. A lot of clinicians, a lot of patient encounters and surveys, but a low burden for each individual clinician. Card studies require about 12 to 24 months from study idea to publication. So, you know, it's not like you say, oh, let's do a card study and you get it done next week. You want to make sure the survey is correct. You want to pilot test it among clinicians. Make sure it's not, you think it takes a minute to fill out and the clinicians are like, wow, that took me eight minutes to fill out. Well, you can't have a clinician spend 80 minutes in an afternoon filling out your survey. Um, so you have to pilot test it. You have to get it in the field out to the clinics, you have to gather the data, you have to analyze the data, um, interpret the data, and then write the paper. Card studies require anywhere from ten dollars to $25,000 to complete. They're not expensive, but they're not free. It takes time. It takes somebody has to do the work. Somebody, you know, part of your, your research team, part of your uh, uh, analyst time, salary support for investigators, project coordinator, biostatistician, or analyst. Sometimes if you're using paper, um, you have to have envelopes and paper and you know, ballot boxes to collect completed cards, et cetera. We have a new card study app. Um, there's an app for that on the smartphone, um, cardstudy uh, dot something, I'm not sure what, dot com maybe, dot app, I don't know. 
Um, we can talk a little bit about that. And then sometimes we give incentives or compensation to the practices for participation, including food or lunches. Um, <clears throat> card studies are typically anonymous and they're perceived low uh, with a level low level of risk to patients. Therefore, they qualify for exempt or expedited institutional review board. Um, you know, it's always important to comply with IRB and HIPAA requirements for collection of protected health information. And so um, most card studies uh, gather um, no PHI. Instead of gathering their date of birth, we may do an age group. Um, so there, there are ways to gather data so that it's both IRB and HIPAA compliant. You want to think about with each of your practices the implementation plan and discuss it with the practice. How does how does it work? Sometimes an afternoon works, sometimes a morning works, sometimes uh, <clears throat> clinicians uh, will, will pick a day that they know that they're not gonna be overwhelmed. Mondays are probably not the best time to do a card study and Friday afternoon may not be the best time to do a card study, but um, you work with your practice to find out what's a typical day, what's a typical half day and think about uh, implementing it during that time period how does the card get into the clinician's hands? Well, when you use paper, there's lots of different flows that can <clears throat> be done um, with electronic health records now. Um, we're actually testing a method to have a card uh, pop up as part of the EHR. That's very difficult, very expensive, time consuming because uh, it takes a programmer to do that. But that may be a way. And now we have the smartphone app, which I think I've mentioned, um, that is a way to collect the data at the time of uh, <clears throat> immediate, uh, uh, when you're seeing the patient, you can complete that card on the smartphone and the data are collected automatically and don't have to be transferred from paper into a database. <clears throat> so we've talked about card studies can be used to describe clinical problems, management and outcomes, and they've been around for a long time. You can do observations, data, actions that can't be cut, captured in the electronic health record. Um, you can't tell what somebody's thinking about sometimes just looking at the electronic health record or what the options were. Um, they're low burden for individual. They're not no burden, but they're low burden. So let's just change base here, switch base here a little bit and talk about a couple of the types of things that might be done in osteopathic uh, medicine. So We've talked about incidents. So how often you see somebody with low back pain or how often do you see somebody with hypertension? Um, so you could do a study on, I think we're thinking about doing a study on osteopathic manipulation for non-musculoskeletal conditions. <clears throat> One of my favorites as I've talked about are prevalence studies where you have a uh, initial question, uh, uh, essentially a qualifying question. Did this patient today have X? long COVID, mental health concern. <clears throat> so you get the prevalence. And then if the answer is no, the survey is complete. If the answer is yes, then you have a series of other questions to follow up with. <clears throat> Treatment. Patients with, we had a whole series of patients with diabetes. And so when they saw a patient with diabetes, um, if the A1C was abnormal, A1C abnormal, yes, no. If yes, if no, finish the survey. If yes, what did you do? What treatments did you do? Nothing. I added medicines. I counseled on diet and exercise and blah, blah, blah. So you can do a whole series of treatments or comparisons of treatments. Which treatment did you pick? Um, so you can do related to specific complaints. The patient came in with headache. The patient has a diagnosis of hypertension or name the diagnosis or other conditions that are not necessarily diagnostic, but have uh, um, a constellation of symptoms that uh, go together. Well, what other clinical questions? Sites of care. Where is osteopathic care delivered? In the hospital, the acute care setting, in the clinic? Um, what's the structure of your practice or the practices you work with? And I think um, a lot of you work at the 
A.T. Still Research Institute. So you may also work part time in a clinic or you may just be in the research institute. But as you're thinking about um, research, what are the care settings that you might want to work in um, and do a card study, whether that's the hospital or the ER, or the ambulatory care setting, home care, uh, hospice. I know we have I've worked with some hospice physicians in the past. <clears throat> So understanding the practice, this was one that um, we talked about at a meeting a couple a while ago. Did the today's visit include osteopathic manipulative medicine? That gets at the prevalence. Um, oh, we were very curious. I think there's going to be some changes around osteopathic billing, and so we were. There's a group that we're interested in. In how do you pay for and how do you bill for? Um, what was the based? What was the diagnosis? So we were talking about maybe it's an open-ended question or a drop down. So what are the top 10 diagnoses that you care for? And then it makes it easier. You don't have to have an open-ended, you don't have to read somebody's handwriting. <clears throat> what did you do during today's visit? So prevalence, diagnosis, treatment, all of those are questions that you might ask. Um, and it might be in the primary care setting, it might be in the hospital or another uh, advanced acute care setting. And then uh, I was particularly uh, intrigued by this part of it. How many additional visits do you anticipate will be required to complete the treatment? Um, and, uh, you know, is this a one time? Is this a long term? Is this a chronic condition? Well, card studies can't do everything everywhere all at once, but they can do something in a group of setting a group of practices in a short period of time and i am going to i think let me just see is this i yeah so uh this gets me to the end which gives us i think 15 or 20 minutes to have conversation a couple of additional references and there's my last blank slide so I am going to come off share and turn it back over to Dr. Jackson to uh, walk us through a conversation. And I'm happy to answer any questions you all have. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Dr. Westfall. That was awesome. I really learned a lot. And I've spent my whole career, 35 plus years in that little box you described at the beginning. So um, it's and exciting to be in this space at this time and expanding the, the opportunities. I hope no one thinks that I um, I totally denigrate that group, that, that research, because mm -hmm. my wife's a basic science researcher and that box is very, very important for it research. Is. It's it absolutely is. necessary but I think it's not sufficient for what we do in primary care. We can't necessarily translate what happens in that little box out into that bigger box. So it, it requires both. So I, I totally honor all the research done in all those boxes, including that little one. Um, I tend to use it as my uh, foil um, because it gets primary care practices engaged and excited to do research. Great. I love it. Thank you. Okay. I'll just open it up to some questions. Does anybody have a particular um, research study that they're thinking about that we could turn into a card study? Um, we have the expert here with us. Is there any questions about a particular um, study that you would be interested in or just a question on card studies or, you know, Dr. Westfall is an expert in research. So if you have any research questions, I'm sure we'd be happy to entertain those as well. So you can just come off mute if anybody wants to put the cameras on. Maybe I should have told folks to wake up. Because <laughs> sometimes that when I drone on, um, I think there's there are several lectures that there's, what's the term called? The auditory A ASMR, I think, is this new thing that there are groups of there are people who they're talking puts people to sleep 
Oh. <laughs> and different sounds like crunching and wrinkling paper. But there are some lecturers who are their YouTube videos have gone viral because they put people to sleep. So maybe <laughs> maybe I should start selling my lectures as ASMR. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Bacon, did you have a question? Hi, Dr. Rustall. My name is Kaylee Bacon. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Athletic Training in our Arizona School of Health Sciences. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it was fantastic hearing from you, but um, more importantly, your article on the card study methodology was wildly helpful uh, for my colleagues and I. We actually did a card study a couple years ago, um, and it, your article really helped us lay out the foundation for that. Oh, that is so gratifying to hear, Kaylee. I never know. You know, you publish a paper, you never know if it gets read. I guess there are things you can now tell um, somewhere. They're recorded somewhere, but I really appreciate that. And um, I'd be very interested. Could you post in the chat the link to your article? Because I'd love to see it. I sometimes will do a bibliography, and I like to catch up on other people's works related to, to some of this as well. So if you could post a chat or email it to me, um, either one would be terrific. And the question is, it's been two years since you did one. Maybe it's time to do another one. Well, we've actually um, adopted the methodology uh, for a few different directions. So uh, the, the first one was on um, athletic trainers' observations of social determinants of health um, in their clinical settings. So, you know, are ATs able to observe uh, social determinants of health? And if so, did they perceive that it was positively or negatively influencing the patient? And then if negative, what actions did they take um, to help address that or to help mitigate it? So that one was really cool. Um, my colleague, Kelsey Pico was the lead on that. Uh, and she was awarded a grant for it. Um, wow. That's but cool. since then, we've uh, used the card to focus on athletic trainers in the physician practice setting. So what um, areas of practice do they um, engage most in in the physician practice? Um, so it's it's been really fun to think of different ways to use the CART approach. It's, it's very cool. And you know, it's one of those, what you're describing is something you wouldn't be able to derive from the electronic health record because you don't right. know, if they don't show up in the electronic health record, you don't know if they interacted with the clinician at the time or not. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times they wouldn't um, right. necessarily show up there. And so you're able to get at something that if you just scour, and I love electronic health record data, but it's it doesn't gather all the, the process things that happen in a practice. Right. And to take it one step further, we actually uh, recently developed our own academic electronic medical um, record. And we actually embedded that social determinants of health card into the documentation form. Cool. So now we can train students to observe uh, those behaviors. So again, your your one article took us a very long way. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Kaylee. So Kaylee, I have to say one other study we did back when I was working in rural Colorado. It was with athletic trainers. It's with high school sports teams. And we would see in August, we would in primary care practice in rural Colorado, we would see this sudden wave of acute Achilles tendonitis. And I'm curious if anyone on the phone can guess what it was caused by. August, rural Colorado, acute Achilles tendonitis. Hiking. I mean, my first inclination would be lack of training or lack of preparation for training over the summer months if we're talking about high school athletes. So the, somebody put cross country runners. However, it, it, it yes but it's a particular type of summer activity that led to athletes suffering in August. And I'll just give it away. If, high, if kids wore cowboy boots all summer on the farm, they would have a foreshortened 
Achilles tendon because of the heel of the cowboy boot. And then when two a days started for training, it would suddenly acutely lengthen that Achilles tendon and cause tendonitis. Uh, cross country runners and football was the, were the two that we saw. The cross country runners tended to um, have been running all summer. And so they went from cowboy boots to running shoes. But oftentimes the football players, they wore cowboy boots, high heel all summer, and then went to cleats and would have, so it's a fun one. Who, what else? So interesting. Okay, other questions? Going once. I have, I have a question. question. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> you wanted to say something first. Um, the person sitting next to me, my partner here, um, asks. Oh, could you do a card study with admin staff that would be invisible, essentially, to clinicians? Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. So you could show what clinical staff do. That's part of um, that. That's one of the benefits of doing a card study is you get at the process. So um, think, thinking about from start to finish in a clinic visit, who touches the patient, who sees them and what do they do? And having a card that followed a patient through the practice um, to say, well, the front desk said hi. The medical assistant roomed them and took their blood pressure. The nurse triage, did triage and asked them. The clinician came in, the post person. That would be very cool, um, absolutely. Jeffrey. Yes, Jack, so my, my question is related to you know your introduction a while ago and um, it was mentioned that you are interested in participatory action research, right? And so I was curious to know if the card studies, and this is talking about you know, beyond bedside care. I was, I was, I was wondering if the card studies have been used as participatory action method tools, whereby the research participants were actually researchers themselves as well. So I'm just curious to know. Yes, absolutely. So uh, um, all of research is participatory, and so we have a community advisory council of farmers, ranchers, school teachers, high school students, college students retired folks, um, and they help identify the types of questions we ask and answer, and then we determine the methods based on the question. And so um, sometimes a card study works for a particular question that the community members have. Um, there was one we did on under insurance. So it was asking for, it was a card study that asked about whether the patient had was adequately insured and whether or not they had um, uh, not done any activities, medical activities based on their insurance status. And, you know, the, the, the limitation of that study is it was only people coming into the practice. So it wasn't people who avoided care altogether. But even amongst people going to the clinic, a third of the time, insurance cover a medicine or a blood test or a, some sort of imaging, <clears throat> that study was actually prompted by our community-based participatory research advisory group. And the, a co-author on that paper was a school teacher, a fourth grade school teacher from Lyman, who it was her idea to do this study. Um, so yes, um, I wouldn't say card studies are a participatory method, but method of participatory research is an approach mm -hmm. to your work in my mind, mm -hmm. and then you pick the methods to ask randomized controlled trial. But if you've engaged the patients and the communities in creating the question, identifying the right methods, that's the approach. So participatory research is really an approach to the care, and then you use a particular method based on the question. Card studies are one of those. And I think probably, oh, I don't know, some number of those of those studies were co-authored by community members uh, through a participatory process. Thank you. Are you guys doing Thank some CBPR or action research, Jeffrey? New to AT Steel, and um, 
my interest really is, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to move to Arizona and from Canada was that I've always been interested about the, the, the plight of migrant workers. And so, you know, that has always been a long interest of mine. And so at one point in my career, I would eventually be taking that path towards, you know, probably considering card studies as one of the tools in my, in my toolbox. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I learned participatory research from um, the, partly from the people I'm sitting next to. Uh, I'm in, I'm at McGill University this week um, okay. as a visiting professor, and I'm studying with um, uh, Jeannie Haggerty and Anne McCauley, who are some of the leaders in participatory research at mm -hmm. McGill, and I'm working with their PBRN to think about how do we expand the participatory research and the community um, work. Yeah. Where were you in Canada? So I was be, I was teaching at the University of Toronto, but you know, mentioned about McGill. That's my alma mater. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, yeah. Montreal awesome. is a wonderful place. So yes. enjoy, well, enjoy the well, weekend I'm there. Having fun in Montreal. Welcome to Arizona. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? This has been awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Westfall. We really appreciate your expertise and your time today. Um, I've learned a lot. And so we, we really appreciate it. Well, I hope you all will um, chat with uh, Brian Dagenhart, Dr. Dagenhart, and uh, the team at DO TouchNet. They're doing a couple of card studies um, in the coming months um, and see how they're doing and how what their approaches are. And then I look forward to any other communications or questions. Uh, feel free to email me um, and uh, have a good uh, have a good week.